I would like to tell you about our guest speaker tonight, Master Beekeeper Tim McMahon. Tim is an Eastern Apicultural Society and Georgia Master Beekeeper, which is all about the honeybee. He has a, been a beekeeper for over 15 years and has had as many as 28 hives going at one time, but now is keeping the number down to around 13 hives. He is also involved in multiple native bee projects here, including at Jug Bay Sanctuary here in Anne Arundel County and abroad. Mr. McMahon is a volunteer with the US Geological Survey Native Bee Lab down in Beltsville, Maryland, and works on native bees projects with the Smithsonian. Uh, that's the Jug Bay program that he's partnering on, and the U.S. California Berkeley in Costa Rica. I'm ready to volunteer for that one as well, Tim. Um, <clears throat> he always has a butterfly net in his car to catch bees, and as you can see in the background of his shot, a microscope on his desk where he spends his days IDing bees. He also has an observational hive that I'm sure he'll talk about as well, that big yellow thing on the wall with the plexiglass, all those bees there. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, this is Master Beekeeper Tim McMahon. Good evening, everyone. It's great to be here. And uh, I hope uh, you have some fun and hopefully you'll have lots of questions because I have lots of answers. Um, I come from a huge family. I'm one of 10 kids. And whenever we get together, most of them ask, where's my honey? And I'm kind of okay with that. That's kind of why I do the beekeeping is to give out honey. Um, but they all think it's theirs. But when they start asking me, how are the bees? I'm like, oh, great. Somebody wants to hear about bees. And I'll start talking about the bees. And then very quickly, the hand will come up. Oh, wait, wait, wait a minute. We were just being polite. I don't want to hear about your bees for the next three hours. Um, so it's great to come to these kind of meetings where actually people are at least somewhat interested in bees. Um, so, uh, we're going to be talking about pollination of flowers, which is uh, done by a variety of things. My cursor. Yeah. I like this little uh, um, cartoon. Uh, do we need any pollen? And who's at the door? It's a bee, because bees are all about pollen. Um, you may see these type of uh, lists. This is from uh, the Bay Area uh, pollinator group. Uh, for some reason, I think they were obsessed with the, the word, the letter B. Uh, I guess that was the letter of the day at uh, on Sesame Street because they talked about bees, birds, butterflies, bats, and beetles. Um, and in the Chesapeake Bay Area, yes, bees pollinate uh, flowers, birds pollinate flowers, butterflies, um, well, moths probably more. Uh, we'll come back to that. Bats. I don't know that we have any bats that are pollinating in this area, maybe. Uh, but beetles, definitely. Um, but they left off a few other things on here. Flies, um, wasps um, are also very large uh, into the pollination. All right, so here's a picture of a hummingbird sticking its beak into a flower, and it's clearly going to contact the stigmas and the anthers and transport pollen and hence it's gonna be a, probably a fairly decent pollinator of these type of hummingbird plants. Uh, and a lot of the hummingbird plants are actually red. Um, bees can't see red, they see it as black. So a lot of the red flowers are, are not designed for bees. But anyway, here's another picture. And this hummingbird is collecting nectar from somewhere else. And the chances of this hummingbird pollinating this sunflower probably pretty low. Um, they're not designed to pollinate that. All right. Um, so what makes bees the best group of pollinators? And they are, in fact, everyone will agree that they are the best group of pollinators. Yes, there are specific plants that are specifically designed for moths or hummingbirds or bats or whatever. Uh, but as a group, uh, bees are far and away the best and most prolific pollinators. And why is that? Well, they're the only group that's actively collecting the pollen. Uh, everyone else that goes to a flower, uh, they're normally going for nectar um, and they're not going to get the pollen. Uh, the bees are going to get the pollen. 
So they are actively finding the pollen and when they move to the next flower, they're carrying it with them. Uh, bees are in fact very hairy uh, and that's in order to trap the pollen and carry it. Uh, their hair is plumose, meaning it's got a lot of branches on it. Um, so that also helps collect the pollen and transport it. Uh, many of the bees are pollen specialists. Uh, it's called oligalactic as opposed to polyalactic, meaning they uh, prefer pollen from one genus or family or group of plants. And that tends to lead to high flower fidelity, meaning the bee is moving from one plant to the another of that same um, genus or species or family. So it's moving pollen from uh, a receptive plant to a receptive plant. Uh, and most of the bees are timing their emergence to come out with those host plants so that they're there when their flowers are there that they want to, to gather the pollen from and move to the next one. Uh, this is a nice little picture of a bee that my godson collected with me when we were down in Arizona on a collecting trip. This bee is called Protoxia glorissa. Uh, everyone's got a Latin name. Uh, but this bee was collecting poly, pollen off of Calistromia, which is the desert poppy or the California poppy. And uh, this has turned into a very popular picture uh, from our uh, US Geological Survey's Native Bee Lab. We put up pictures all the time, and I'll give you links to those later on. Uh, this picture has been very popular because people love how much pollen is on this bee. So what's the chances of this bee carrying pollen to the next flower and pollinating that next flower? And the chances are huge. Um, and that's why bees are so good. And here's a picture of a bumblebee. And I just put this in here to show you how hairy uh, a bee can be. And bumblebees are some of the hairiest bees. Um, also some of the most commonly seen because they're so big, people notice them. All right, there is a battle going on between bees and plants. And why is there a battle going on? Well, bees don't care about pollination. They don't know what it is. They don't plan on doing it. It's not their thing. Uh, plants care about it. Bees want the pollen. Not only do they want the pollen, they want all the pollen. Pollen is the protein source that bees feed to their, their young. Bees are insects, so they go through the normal insect uh, cycle of egg, a larval stage, a pupa, and then the adult phase. So that's just like a, a butterfly. Butterfly goes from egg to the caterpillar, which is the larval stage. It spins a cocoon, pupates, and comes out as an adult. So bees are doing the same thing, and it's that larval stage that eats pollen. Um, and that's its protein source. So bees are collecting that as opposed to all the other wasps, which are normal collecting insects and eating meat. And bees are the vegetarian wasps. Um, pollen is costly for that plant to produce and it wants to protect it and it wants to make sure it gets to that next plant. So who are the smart ones in this? And there are, thousands of papers written about the different ways plants uh, make protect their pollen and try to make sure their pollen gets to the next flower. Um, so there's windborne pollen and uh, that's a, a, a very uh, hard way for the plant to ensure that it gets where it's going because it just sends out billions of pollen grains on the wind hoping that it gets to the place it wants to be. Uh, but uh, the flowers that are using insects to transport their pollen are using much larger pollen grains and they're using all sorts of mechanisms so that uh, they can ensure that that pollen gets to where they want it to go. Uh, they're tricking the bees to carry the pollen the way they want to and going back to the flowers they want. So here's a nice picture of there's a whole group of flowers that force bees to force their way into the flower to get to the nectar in the pollen. And the, the stigmas that uh, 
receive the pollen are then brushed up against you when the bee is forced to go into these flowers. So there's a whole series of plants like this. A lot of the legumes fall into this category. The, the bees have to force their way in and it's the way the plant's ensuring that it's gonna get a little bit of pollen off of those insects. Here's a poppy type flower and it's very open and the, it, this flower is using a completely different mechanism, which is I'm hoping that a, something that's big enough will come in and land and, and contact both the anther and the stigma and move the pollen from the male to the female um, parts of the flower. And so here's a, a nice longhorn bee and it's clearly big enough and it's going to be able to move that pollen from the one uh, on, from one flower to another and definitely contact the stigmas to uh, deliver that pollen. Uh, I really like this picture. This is a fly, um, but flies actually have a certain amount of hair on them and they actually are quite good pollinators and many things are uh, dependent upon flies. Uh, one of the common things that are is uh, routinely pollinated by flies is pears and carrots. Um, they're actually are much more commonly pollinated by flies than they are by bees. This is a nice little picture and I'm not sure, if, can you see my uh, cursor? Yep, we can see it. Okay, so this uh, this is a moth and it's got its tongue straight down into this flower to suck up the nectar. But it's also contacting the stigma and anthers. And it's a moth, so it's quite hairy. So here's uh, an example of moth that's probably a very good pollinator of this plant. Um, and that's what these plants are doing. They tend to be quite large if they're moth pollinated, um, and they're forcing the moth to come in and contact both the stigma and the anthers. Again, the moth doesn't care about the pollen. They don't want the pollen. Um, they're coming in for the nectar. Uh, this is what I consider to be a fantastic photograph of why I am not a big fan of people constantly talking about butterflies as pollinators. All right, so these are asters, and we got a picture here of a carpenter bee and a monarch butterfly on asters. And that carpenter bee is just rubbing itself all the way across the stigma and anthers and clearly it's going to be doing a good job of pollinating these asters. Uh, the monarch butterfly on the other hand comes in it's got a very very long tongue it's got very long legs uh, and the pollen doesn't normally stick to the legs or the tongue of the monarch butterfly and butterflies are notoriously weak at pollinating. Uh, they don't have the hairs. They're not contacting the, the stigmas and the anthers of many plants. Um, they're extremely pretty. And everyone loves butterflies. And people talk about butterfly gardens all the time. But in reality, they're not very good pollinators. Moths tend to be very good pollinators. Butterflies, not so much. But that doesn't change the fact they're very pretty and everyone loves them. All right, so I wanted to go over some basic bee numbers before I start talking about bees in Maryland and bees in Anne Arundel County. Um, in the entire world, there's well over 20,000 named species of bees. And in the United States, we have over 4,000 named species uh, bees. And about 70% of those bees are actually ground nesting bees. There are holes in the ground uh, and, the, and the bees uh, nest in the ground. They uh, lay their eggs in the ground. Um, there's a certain percentage that are cavity nesters. Those are the mason bees, the leaf cutter bees, but most of them are ground nesting bees. About 10% of all species of bees are colonial, meaning they have colonies. Uh, the ones that come to mind that people will always see are honeybees and bumblebees. Those are both colonial bees. Uh, they have a colony, there's a queen, and there are worker bees. Um, the other bees in this area that are colonial, uh, some of the sweat bees, the little tiny 
tiny sweat bees that will actually occasionally land on your hand and, and lick up your sweat. Uh, some of the sweat bees are colonial. Uh, those colonies tend to be very, very small, uh, somewhere between five and 20 bees uh, in the colony, uh, but they are colonial. Um, about 25% of the species of bees are pollen specialists. Um, and it, that's kind of a misnomer of what a pollen specialist is. It's not normally this bee goes to one plant. It's usually that bee likes things in that uh, family of plants. There's a whole group of bees that are aster specialists. Aster ACA is a family of uh, plants and a lot of bees are specialists on asters. Um, there are a few bees that go to a single plant, um, but usually that plant is immensely common. Um, the, the biggest, most common one that comes to mind is Laria, uh, the creosote bush out in the desert south, southwest. It has maybe 75 different pollen specialists that go to it, but it's also one of the most common plants in the desert southwest. Um, and something most people don't realize is the average adult bee only lives a few weeks. Um, and so they're only adults for a, a short period of time. And most of them are, are annual. They come out every year uh, here, especially in, in this type of region. They come out every year. In the deserts, they may come out uh, only when the rains come. Um, so they might stay in the ground for many years. Um, so I want to go over some of our numbers. Uh, that we have uh, in the lab, because I'm a volunteer in the U.S. Geological Survey's Native Bee Lab, uh, and we have all of our information is up online in what's called Discover Life, and it's a searchable database for a wide variety of things, but bees is very well done in Discover Life. Um, so in our database that's on Discover Life, we have 367 different species of bees for Maryland, uh, we believe we have a total of 445 species of bees in Maryland, and the difference in numbers comes from uh, old literature that we have. Some, uh, someone from back in 1906 wrote a paper saying, I found this bee in Maryland. Uh, we don't have that bee, and we haven't found that bee since then, but somebody said they found it at some point in Maryland. Um, and we have about 150,000 records just for Maryland in that Discover Life database. Uh, which has millions of records in it. Um, Sam Drogi is the head of the bee lab for the U.S. Geological Survey, and when he first started there back in 2001, I believe, uh, he started a project where he was trying to make sure that uh, we had found at least 100 bee species in each county. Uh, I worked on this project for many years, um, and the bottom line is a lot of counties, a lot of areas were not uh, actively being looked after uh, and checked for bees. Uh, there aren't that many entomologists. Um, there are a million boaters in the world. There are a million fishermen in the world. Uh, there are very few people out with nets like me, crazies, uh, who are collecting bees. So uh, the number of bees that are known in an area is quite low to what it truly is. Uh, you'll see the three large counties here in the, in the lower right um, show uh, Prince George's County, and that's where the Bee Lab is located, Anne Arundel County, which uh, has its own set of stuff going on that I'll talk about later, and Montgomery County. Those are the three most collected counties. Not that the other counties don't have as many bees, they're just not actively collected. Um, lowest on the list here is Baltimore City. It probably is the lowest. One, it's small, and two, there's just not much open space there. Um, so let's go to the, the next slide. Here is a, a, pro, a, a paper that Sam wrote a while back that I helped him with, where we were trying to figure out how many bees are there here in Maryland? Uh, and how many bees are there per acre? Um, so we looked at our database and yes, there are lots of assumptions here. And yes, there's ways that we could have done this that could have shown you know, the plus or minus type of thing, but we were just trying to go for a ballpark. Uh, in our database at the time, and this was about four or five years ago, we had about 150,000 records in our database. Of those, 
uh, we had about two and a half thousand records of honeybees. Um, I talked with the state apiarist uh, to get our estimate of the number of hives in Maryland. We came up with an estimate of the number of adult worker bees in a hive for a year. And for the year, we considered February through November, uh, the typical season when there are things in bloom. And so there's about, in the average colony of honeybees, there's about 250,000 bees in that time period that come out, live, and then die. Uh, so there's a bunch of assumptions in there uh, that may or may not be completely accurate or have a wide range of numbers that they could have. But using all those numbers, we came up with the average acre in Maryland we'll see 27,000 bees in the average acre of Maryland, not in any one day, but from February to November. And the total state for that time period, we'll see over 2 billion bees. Um, so there are a lot of bees out there. Um, I find this quite interesting. I'm not sure anybody else does. Um, so I wanted to go into a, a few examples of interesting things that bees do. Um, one of the people I know is a, a researcher, he's from Canada, actually he's from Great Britain, living in Toronto, a professor at York University in Canada. And he does a lot of work in the high altitude desert of the Atacama in Chile. And this picture is from a place up in Chile. It's not the place I wanted to show you, but I didn't have pictures of, of his area. The place he does a lot of his work is at 14,000 feet. But the same thing happens there. Uh, the average rainfall in the area he was doing his work is less than 0 0.1 inches of rain per year, which is a complete misnomer because the area go traditionally goes for 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 years without rain, then they'll get three inches of rain in one day. Um, so that averages out to you know 0 0.1 inches per year, uh, but it, it's not that much rain. But you can see on the left here, we have the barren landscape. And after the rain, and this is that same area, boom, all these flowers come up. Uh, so two things are very interesting about this. There's a seed bank there, very weird, uh, but there's a seed bank literally almost everywhere that there is soil on this planet, um, which I just find completely fascinating. But there are also bees out there that are sitting under that ground waiting for that rain to come. When that rain comes, they pupate, they come out, and they'll pollinate these flowers. Uh, what kind of weird bees would those be? Well. Here's a bee from the Atacama Desert. And the flowers that come out of the Atacama Desert have very, very deep uh, flowers to protect that nectar so it doesn't evaporate quickly. And so this bee has uh, an extremely elongated head. It's got a very narrow abdomen. And this is so it can get down into that flower. Now, bee's tongues do not roll up like uh, butterfly tongues do, they fold under. So the tongue is folded under the head here and this little knob you can see back here, that's actually the back end uh, of the middle part of the tongue that's folded under. And when it comes out, it looks something like this. From the, the antenna out to the end of the tongue is longer than the rest of the body. Very strange bees um, handling very strange conditions so that uh, they can get those nectars out of that flower. Uh, here's some uh, list of some common bees that we find in uh, Maryland. Again, we have over 440 species that we found. Uh, most of these fall into the category of sweat bees. Um, there's one bee in here I think is very interesting, this Andrina erangeriae, uh, which was found on uh, a plant and it was so named and this, but this bee is actually a pollen specialist on Claytonia. And if anyone knows Claytonia is spring beauty, it's a uh, uh, ephemeral uh, flower in, in the understory of forests. And this bee is actually quite common in Maryland. 
Um, but it only comes up in that early springtime when the spring beauties are out. So if you're looking to um, help bees, what can you do? Uh, what do need, bees need? So when a bee emerges out, uh, one, we're talking about the female because uh, in, in the world, uh, it's always the females who are the most important. Uh, I'm sure half the people in this uh, uh, talk here will agree with that. Uh, so what does the, the female need? Well, she needs to find a mate, which is probably very easy to do since uh, if she was nesting here, there's probably males close by. Now she probably needs uh, nesting sites and nesting materials. Uh, which may be resin, maybe leaves, uh, maybe dirt and pebbles, uh, probably do exist in this area because her mother last year laid her uh, egg here. And so that material probably is here. But she also needs uh, the floral resources, the flowers that these bees like. Now, maybe they were here last year and they're no longer here. Uh, if they're not, then she's got to go find them. And bees are really good about finding that. Uh, what else do bees need? That They're looking for the less broken habitat. Uh, bees do much better when uh, there is a lot of their floral resource around as opposed to a little patch here and a little patch there uh, with large uh, gaps in between. And that's one of our big problems is we have a lot of broken habitat here in, in the world nowadays. Um, and when they don't get what they want, which either is the mating, or the nest site and nest materials or the flowers they want, they disperse. And they do a really good job of this. Uh, and lots of studies have shown this. Uh, we did a study here with at the US Geological Survey. We went out to uh, FedEx Field and we put out uh, traps. Uh, bees will check out anything that might be a flower. So we put out little traps, which are little tiny two ounce uh, bowls. So they're painted a white, blue, or yellow, and we fill them up with a little bit of soapy water and the bees will come in and check it out. And because there's soapy water in there, they, there's not enough surface tension for them to get off it and they get stuck in there and we can find them. So we put these bowls out in the middle of FedEx field way back when, uh, literally a mile in one direction to flowers and a half mile in the other direction. And we were catching bees every day. So, uh, bees disperse really well. Uh, if they didn't, they wouldn't have survived. Uh, and it also is a great thing because if you plant the flowers, the bees will come. If you have no bees in your yard, which I um, almost guarantee you, you do, uh, you plant the flowers and the bees will come. Um, uh, the picture up in the upper right, this is actually a, a very large bee. This is called the giant resin bee. It's almost as large as a carpenter bee, and it can be found here in Maryland. I think it's a very, very interesting looking bee. So I put it on here. All right. What issue are our bees having? Well, honeybees are having a lot of issues. Um, now, some people will claim that honeybees are not native. Um, it is true that. Uh, the settlers that first came over from Europe brought honeybees with them, and there were no honeybees here at the time. But honeybees did exist here at one time, just like horses and camels did. Um, there was fossils that we have found in Nevada that are about 16 million years old, and they're fossils of honeybees. So honeybees were here long after the continent separated. They obviously had died out, um, and settlers brought them back. And the joke among beekeepers is that the first unemployed person on the, the Plymouth ship that landed in uh, the Mayflower that landed in Plymouth was the beekeeper because they brought two honeybee hives over with them and they died in transit. And so the first unemployed person in America from Europe was the beekeeper. Um, so honeybees first made it to America in Jamestown, Virginia settlement and then spread across the United States and South America very quickly. So what are honeybees suffering from? And in this picture, you can see there is a, uh, a mite uh, on this bee. This is a tick type creature that sucks 
uh, fatty cells out of the pupa. They only feed on the pupas. Um, and it vectors a huge amount of uh, viruses and activates viruses in the bees. And it is ravaging honeybees across the world. Uh, it's a mite that has jumped species and Apis mellifera, the uh, the eastern, the western honeybee, it cannot handle this very well. Um, so it's having huge trouble. Uh, that is our biggest problem. The next biggest problem that honeybees are having is lack of habitat. Uh, there's just not enough resources to keep them going. They are hoarders by nature. Um, they gather nectar and they turn it into honey so that they can eat it over the winter. They do not go through a a period where they are hibernating, like a lot of uh, solitary bees that go through a hibernation phase. Honeybees go through the winter as adults and they eat through their store of honey. Um, and that's why they are gathering so much nectar and converting it into honey. And that's why we can get it from them because they're hoarders by nature and we can steal it from them. And then of course, the last thing um, that is troubling uh, honeybees, and in all bees for that matter, is insecticides, fungicides, herbicides. Um, but a lot of people want to make it out like that's the number one problem. Um, for honeybees, it's literally third on the list. Um, and for most other bees, it's probably second on the list after loss of habitat. So, yes. Insecticides kill bees. Bees are good for us, um, and the insecticides tend to kill all insects, and it's really hard to kill one insect without killing the one next to it. And in case if anyone's uh, interested, this little green bee here, Agricolorella arata, is our most common bee here in Maryland. Um, in our uh, database alone, we have 22,000 records of Agrochlora errata. It's very common to be. It's seen all summer long. It's polyelectric, meaning it doesn't have a pollen uh, source that it prefers. It goes to almost anything. Uh, earlier, we talked about uh, Jug Bay, which is uh, right on the Patuxent River. Uh, that's the Patuxent River there on the left side of this picture. Uh, and Jug Bay is. Uh, um, I think it's a state park. Um, I forget exactly. Uh, but we've been doing county park. County park, right? But we've been doing uh, research out there for three years now. Um, if anyone's familiar with the fall line that runs up and down the East Coast, not the fault line, which is uh, different. This is the fall line uh, where um, we we transition from a large amount of granite and hard rock to sandy areas. Uh, and it, it literally, it drops off there. Uh, and all the major cities on the East Coast almost uh, were built on the fall line because that's where um, the rivers stopped. So Philadelphia, Baltimore, Washington, Richmond, Atlanta, those are all on the fall line. Um, and for thousands of years, almost everything east of the fall line was grassland. And um, because it was grassland, uh, the prevailing winds would uh, move the, uh, the very loose soil around and we would have find large deposits of sand. And right here along the Patuxent River, there's a huge amount of sand. Um, a matter of fact, this one road up here on the upper right-hand side is called Sands Road. And here in Jug Bay, uh, it's, it's hard to see, but there are two open areas on this, uh, this one area back over here. And then the central area here with the pine trees in it, those were both mined for sand. So this area has very sandy soil and therefore has different flora. Uh, it has a lot of things that like sandy soil. And therefore with different plants, you get different fauna. Um, so there are different bees that show up here that don't show up in most other places. And we've found just fascinating amount of different types of bees in this area. Here's a short list. There's at least two other bees that were found here. 
uh, that have been found nowhere else in Maryland um, and that were all found in, in the Jug Bay sand area. Um, I find that quite interesting, all right? Uh, some bees are pollen specialists on things that are essentially gone. Uh, uh, there was uh, a large amount of chestnuts here in the United States. Most of the chestnuts have uh, died out from a blight. Uh, there was this small black bee. It looks very big in this picture, uh, but it's, it's quite a small bee, Andrina renii, and it was a pollen specialist and it only went to chestnuts. And for many years, people had believed that this bee had disappeared. Uh, when about four years ago, we found it again on chinkapin. And chinkapin is a chestnut relative. Uh, so these bees are out there in small numbers uh, spread out. And it's actually been found again also on the, the chestnuts that people are trying to bring back. So I find that interesting also. Uh, this is my favorite thing. This is a bee that we found in, um, in uh, Jug Bay. I found it two years ago. Uh, I collected it on daughter. And if you don't know what daughter is, that's this stuff here, this orange viney stuff. It's actually a parasitic plant. Uh, it tends to grow in water, on water plants. Um, and uh, it's, in the, it's called the genus Cascuta. Um, and it's very inconspicuous. Uh, it tends not to choke out its host very much. Um, but this bee was considered extinct. Uh, the last time this bee had been caught in the United States was 1949. And the last time there was a record for this area was 1929. Matter of fact, there was only one record of this bee east of Indiana since 1929. And it was found in Alexandria. Um, but I found this bee two years ago because uh, I was out in the swamp, literally wading through the swamp. Uh, I didn't even know what daughter was at the time. I saw this little black bee on this and I collected it. Uh, we ID'd it out. And then we have since gone around and we have found uh, multiple locations in this area where this bee has been found on daughter, uh, even over across the river in Virginia. So there is lots of bees out there that people don't know anything about because there aren't enough crazy people like me going out uh, to look for them. All right. Uh, the one more place I want to talk about is Mount Cuba in Delaware. Uh, if you have not been to Mount Cuba, it's well, well worth a visit. Uh, Mount Cuba is an old uh, DuPont estate that has been turned in. What well, the original DuPont owners actually turned it into this huge, massive garden ground, uh, and it's absolutely gorgeous. And a few years back, a man named Matt Saber uh, got permission to do a bee study at this place. And Matt found a whole litany of bees uh, that are pollen specialists on the plants that were there in Mount Cuba. And it's absolutely fascinating. Um, and here's some highlights. He found 15 species of native bees that have never been found before in Delaware. Uh, he's found bees that uh, the closest uh, area that these bees have been found is over 350 miles well, away. I don't and hear everything you say. Can everyone hear? I assume people can hear me. I'm not right. hearing anything. Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to mute them. Don't worry. You can continue. Um, Assateague Island is another unique environment, it's a, a big sandbar. Oh. Um, and we have found these four bees out there on Assateague Island that we haven't found anywhere else. So Assateague Island obviously is a unique environment and it's got its own unique set of bees. So a lot of people always ask, what can we do for bees? Well, native flowers are obviously better for bees than, than non-natives. Um, but planting a single flower is not enough. You wanna plant a plot. You know, We normally tell people if you wanna really help them, a four foot by four foot plot of that flower is 
going to be able to sustain a group of them of uh, bees. Um, so a single plant is usually not enough. A single tree might be, but uh, a plot you want to use uh, a fair number of plants to support a group of bees. Uh, you want to leave some bare ground, which I'm really good at uh, in my yard. Uh, I have a lot of brown areas of my yard, uh, and that's for those ground nesting bees. Uh, you want to avoid using pesticides, pesticides, fungicides, herbicides if you can. Uh, and grass is a no-no. Now, I have nothing against grass. I have grass. Um, most people have grass. But if you have a large amount of grass and you're not using that, uh, for, for most insects uh, and most beneficial insects, that's a desert. Um, grasses are all windborne and that does nothing for for almost anybody, uh, try to plant things that are nice, plant flowers in there. Uh, I've converted my whole front yard from grass over to shrubs and flowers. Um, I do wanna talk about this little bee here that I have a picture of, and I have a picture on the next slide. Uh, this is a bee I picked up in Costa Rica. It is a stingless bee. Stingless bees are colonial bees. They produce honey, um, and they're found around the world in the tropics and they are the most prolific bees that you can find in the tropics are the stingless bees. There's over 450 different species of stingless bees in the world and uh, very common in the tropics. And they're called stingless bees because the stinger is so small and not very sclerotized and it physically can't sting you. Uh, some of them actually have learned to, to bite and the bite can be annoying and can chase you off. But this specific bee here has salivary glands that produces formic acid. And these bees can be very dangerous. Uh, the group I was with at the time, we were down there, we were hiving a colony of these, uh, these bees. This is a species called Oxytrigona is the genus, and the species is Melicolor. Meli means honey, so it's a honey-colored um, bee but it was inside of a tree and we were, had cut it open, opened it up, took out that comb and put it in a box. Um, for the study, it was done with the, the University of Costa Rica group. And uh, so these bees were going crazy and everyone was suited up head to toe, hands were covered. Um, and one girl, I call her a girl, she was a college student, um, had a couple of these bees got in under her, uh, her suit and stung her, or not stung her, spit on her back several times, and she ended up in the hospital. So sometimes uh, these bees can be uh, very annoying. All right, uh, and that picture of this bee on here is that same bee that's a, a face front uh, picture of that bee. All right, so what can you do uh, to avoid using those pesticides and fungicides? Um, and herbicides so that you don't hurt bees. Um, well, if you can apply those pesticides and, and other things on something other than the flower itself, uh, most bees are not going after the, the leaves or the stems. Um, so that's uh, one way of helping the bees out is not applying those pesticides to the flowers. Uh, if you do need to apply it to the flower, uh, applying it late in the day, uh, professor preferably in the evening, uh, will help prevent uh, contact of the bees with that pesticides. Uh, try not to use plants that are treated with neonicotinoids. Uh, short, the short word for that is neonics. Uh, that is a systemic pesticide. And what that means is it's usually applied to the seed and it penetrates the seed and it literally ends up in every cell of the plant and neonicotinoids are fantastic insecticides. They kill insects really, really well. But there are beneficial insects like bees, butterflies, wasps, um, that you don't wanna kill, and the neonics kill those too. So we wanna to try to avoid plants using neonics. If you wanna kill weeds, um, let's talk about that definition of what a weed is. Uh, for someone who likes bees, uh, my bees love weeds. Uh, and um, 
almost any flowering thing in the wild will attract bees. And there's probably a pollen specialist that is on that, but most people won't like it because they call it considered a weed. Um, uh, if you do want to get rid of those weeds, try to do it uh, after those flowers are gone. That will help the bees. If you want to plant something to try to prevent weeds from coming up, uh, we do this a lot uh, out at the lab. We lay down uh, five to six inches of mulch. Uh, actually, we lay down a layer of newspaper and five to six inches of mulch. We dig through the mulch, rip the newspaper, plant what we want to plant. Uh, and what that does is that allows your plants to take root and, and uh, propagate and keeps the normal weeds that are in the, the seed bank there from coming up. Um, so those are things you can do to uh, plant better, hopefully for bees. Now, uh, this picture is uh, a friend of mine uh, who goes to Costa Rica with us. This is a picture from Costa Rica. Uh, this guy is uh, also an entomologist and he was taking pictures of our group that was hiding this colony of these bees that spit formic acid. And his hand was in a glove um, and he was manipulating his camera. And the bees got all over his suit and all over the camera and they spit all over his camera. Uh, but that isn't when he got got like this. After we were all done, we were away, he got out of his suit, he started manipulating his camera lens again. All that formic acid on that camera lens led to all of this. You can even see there's a nice big blister on the inside of his pinky here and all these brown spots are not because he's old. He is, he's even older than I am, uh, but that's all formic acid burns. So, I just find that interesting. It's this little tidbit here. All right, uh, <clears throat> I'll leave this up for a second. Uh, there is a young man, Jared Fowler, who came up with this list. This is for East Coast. Uh, he lists all of the bees where they're uh, where they can be found and uh, the time of year they're out and what they are pollen specialists on. These aren't the list of all the bees, but these are the bees that we know that tend to have uh, uh, preferences for pollen. So you'll see a lot of things on here that are quite common. Salix is willow, uh, ericaceous shrubs are all the blueberries, uh, asteraceae are all the asters uh, that traditionally come out in um, the, the fall time frame. Uh, so if anybody's interested, uh, you can go to Jared Fowler's uh, page here. Um, and uh, he updates this occasionally with new information if any comes out. Uh, again, these are all Eastern bees that are pollen specialists and uh, he's listing what they are pollen specialists of. So. Now, the last thing I wanna show you is all the pictures that we've gotten here um, are taken from our lab in Beltsville. And uh, we put these pictures, high def pictures up online and we put them in a, a variety of places, uh, not all at the same place. Um, let me see if I can get rid of this. Um, why is, um, I cannot get rid of this. I can't seem to get rid of that. Anyway. Um, there we go. Uh, so we have pictures up on Flickr, Instagram, Tumblr, Facebook, uh, and you can find them at these locations. And these are high def pictures, high def. You can zoom in, zoom in and zoom in. You can get down and see an individual hair on these bees. The, the pictures are absolutely amazing. And because we're a government agency, these pictures are free. And anybody can take them and anybody can use them for anything they want to. Uh, lots of people have taken them and, and made calendars and posters and have made money off them. And we are perfectly okay with that. And we even ask you, don't even ask our permission because that's just more work for us to read that email and respond back saying, yes, you can do this. Um, Cause th these are all public domain things that we uh, government agency have put out there 
Um, but the pictures are absolutely gorgeous. Um, and there's lots of them. Uh, that the one picture I showed you at the beginning of the bee covered in orange pollen, that's one of the more popular ones. Uh, people love to see that. Um, but there are lots and lots of pictures in there, thousands actually. Okay, I'd like to open it up now and uh, let people go ahead and ask uh, questions. Can we have a round of applause for Tim, ladies and gentlemen? And uh, I'm going to start us off with a couple questions as a fellow beekeeper. Um, I have a, several, but I'll, I'll leave it to a couple and then I'll come back to the last couple. Um, Neonix and buying um, box store vegetable plants. Is it true that like stuff that's getting mass produced, sold at my Lowe's and Home Depot are highly suspect with Neonix or do yes. you have to read fine print? Yes. So it's highly suspect. If you ask someone at Home Depot, is this treated with neonicotinoids? They will have no idea what you're talking about. None. Um, and whether it is or isn't is unclear. Uh, they definitely were selling lots of stuff in the past with neonicotinoids. Uh, Home Depot came out with a statement saying, we don't do this anymore. And clearly that they have. Um, so it, it's always a crap shoot when you're buying plants or even seeds from these places because uh, you don't know what they've been treated for. If you're buying them from uh, most nursery and garden type places, uh, they're not treating them with neonicotinoids. Um, but, okay. Uh, and then um, with uh, my hive in the winter, I put in the fondant, tuck them in for the winter, and I've had two of my six years where they've died over the winter. Um, insight on that, do I need to treat for Varroa mites closer to the end of the year or is that a bad idea? Because I know Varroa mites, when they attack, it's too late once you see them infested. So is there a connection to Varroa mites and them wintering over successfully? Yes, yes. So most overwinter deaths of honeybee colonies is caused by Varroa mites, either directly or indirectly. Um, the biggest problem is uh, how do you treat to prevent the varroa mite? The mite is not technically an insect. It's a, it's a mite, so it's, a, it's got eight legs instead of six. And how do you kill one bug that lives on another bug without hurting uh, the bug you want to save? Um, so treating is always going to be very rough on the bees because uh, you're usually treating with something that they don't like either, but you're trying to hopefully kill the, the mite without hurting the bee. It's kind of like chemotherapy. If I give you enough chemotherapy, it will kill you. Um, but you're trying to hope that the chemotherapy kills the cancer cells faster than it kills all your other cells. Um, the problem with varroa mites is, um, is the way bees live their lives. As a colony is declining, uh, and it will normally decline in the fall time, if it's dying off, uh, it gets robbed out by other hives. So this is how the varroa mites jump from one hive to the next. So this hive is dying um, and the mites somehow know this and they will always jump onto other bees that come in. And um, so robbing happens. So uh, your hive is dying, bees from other colonies come in rob and they pick up varroa mites and take them back to, to their hives. So if you treat your hives in the fall, which is what almost every beekeeper does, and you test before you treat and say, oh, I have a certain level of varroa mites, you then treat and then you test again and say, wow, I've, I've knocked the varroa mites way down, that's great. And that might be great. But then tomorrow, if your bees then go rob out a colony that's infested with varroa mites, you now from one day to the next have gone from almost no varroa mites to thousands and thousands of varroa mites running around your colony. Yeah. So it's a very, very hard thing to um, keep out of your colony. They're, they're always gonna be in your colony. You're trying to keep them at low numbers and it's always hard to keep them at low numbers. You can test today and say, wow, I have almost no mites. And tomorrow your hive can be inundated into the point where it won't survive the winter and you may not even know. So Do you have to test or can you just, um, Every like three or four months, like twice a season, or 
I test uh, almost once a month from April through November. Um, and again, that doesn't mean that's going to help. I almost always test, I treat three times a year uh, and I always test before and after. So that's that's nine tests right there. Um, and, and the idea is you wanna test first and say, what, what are my level that I wanna treat and then I wanna test again to see what kind of effect it had. Maybe the, the compounds I'm using aren't effective enough or whatever, or maybe they were old or maybe they, I applied it wrong or whatever. So you wanna do that test before and after. Um, but uh, if you're not testing, you don't know. And most people don't test when it gets into November anyway. Uh, but you, your bees can still pick up a lot of rural mites and then die over the winter because of what happened in November. Yeah. But there is treatment you can do in the winter. There's an oxalic acid treatment that you can do, uh, which is a vaporization method. You put it in on a little heating tray, you heat it up, it vaporizes, uh, and it's, a, it's an acid. It's um, very chemically similar to formic acid, and it literally burns holes in the rural mites and they desiccate and die. Uh, thanks, Tim. Um, if people have questions, feel free to come off mute and ask them. You can also drop them in the chat, as I mentioned earlier in the presentation. So, I'll let you go ahead. Yeah, Eloise, can you take yourself off mute and go ahead? Um, I, I had two questions um, about the beginning and the ending of the season. At the very beginning of spring, I have these wonderful uh, ragworts blooming, um, but I didn't see a whole lot of bee action on them or pollinator action. They were the first things to come out in the spring and they lasted for a long time. And on the other end of the spectrum, I have uh, some um, chrysanthemums. It's a type of chrysanthemum. It's the very last thing that blooms in the fall, and it's loaded with all kinds of little pollinators, mostly flies and tiny beetles. little things. Yep, um, tiny beetles. Yep. Yeah, but not. I I haven't seen many bees. And yeah. related to all of this is. Uh, I, I built uh, with some children um, a bee hotel made out of bamboo, little bamboo um, pieces with holes in the end. But my um, my bee hotel doesn't seem to be uh, occupied at all, and it's been two it's been two years. So I'm wondering if that's anything that uh, you know we 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 built these things with our children, but I wonder if if that's just a lost cause. Well, okay, so. Let's start with the bee hotels. Bee hotels are, are a lot of fun and they're a great way to watch the those bees. Um, hopefully your holes are small enough and or big enough uh, for the bees. Um, but interestingly enough, there's never been any indication that lack of um, nest sites is an issue with that group of bees. Uh, most of those bees fall into the category of what we call uh, Leaf cutter bees or mason bees, they use those. And th there are cavities everywhere in large quantities, and they really don't need our help for the nest sites. It's great for us to put them out there so that we can see them and observe them and watch them. And that's a great naturalist type of thing so that you can show people. Um, I would keep doing it and hopefully they'll come. Uh, I've put up some in my backyard in years past and they show up. Um, I don't know why they're not showing up in your place. Uh, they are tend to be all spring bees uh, that use those. Um, so I can just say, keep trying with those. Um, so the chrysanthemums, I agree. I don't know. I've never really seen bees go to chrysanthemums. Uh, and then the early spring bees, uh, literally coming out in February, there are, are at least uh, two different genera of bees, uh, Andrina bees and Caledes, uh, that tend to come out first. Uh, I usually see them as early as the first week of February, they're starting to come out. Um, and uh, they're all tend to be very nondescript, little black bees with 
maybe brown hair, um, not easy to recognize, very small, um, and most people won't even notice them. Uh, but my guess is those bees, the bees are there. So. All right, if I could make a suggestion to everyone, this stack back here is an observation hive I have in my house. I think you should all have one in your house. It's much better than watching television, watching the bees. Awesome stuff. Um, Tim, you, what, what's your sugar water um, ratio when you're putting it out? Do you do a straight 50-50 mix or does it depend on the time of year, dearth, and do you feed the entire year at your hives or do you let mother nature steer? Uh, I almost never feed my bees except in the fall, um, especially if I've taken honey off of them. Uh, I've taken away what they, they're going to use for the winter and then I will feed them going into the winter. At that point, I usually feed them two to one, two parts sugar to one part water. Um, that's just so I can get more into them faster and they have to do less work dehydrating that uh, and getting rid of that water. Um, I, I will only feed, uh, the only time I will feed in the springtime is if I put in a new colony and I feel like I'm, uh, you know, we got a long period of rain coming up or whatever, and then I'll feed them one to one. Um, the average nectar in plants usually runs between 5% sugar up to maybe 50% sugar, uh, and that's one to one. So the, the most concentrated nectar out there is things like black locust trees, and that's about one to one. So you really don't need to feed anything thicker than that. Um, but otherwise, I, I, I will occasionally feed in the summertime if, if I go in and find that my bees are starving which has happened in certain years when we are in a severe drought type of situation. Um, but if we're getting any little bit of rain, that little Dutch clover in everyone's yard comes up. Uh, if it rains today, tomorrow you have Dutch clover blooming and it's a great nectar source for bees. Nice. Uh, any other questions from folks? Uh, go ahead, Tom, and I'll come back to you, Eloise. Tim, what's the story between carpenter bees? Are we supposed to like them even though they're gnawing away in our, our wooden homes? <laughs> I love carpenter bees. Now, there is, there's only one carpenter bee, true carpenter bee, here in, in our area. Um, Xylocopa is the genus, Xylocopa. Xyla means wood, copa means cutting. And it's a big bee, it's huge, it's the biggest bee in our area. Um, and it can make a, a, a wreck of wood, especially soft wood. And the nests get used again and again and again, year after year. So if they find a place with, with great nesting site, uh, the next generation uses it, expands it, and can make a mess of a deck or whatever. Um, but I, I have a brick and block house, so. It doesn't, they, don't bother, they do not bother me. Um, now, there are a bunch of what we call the, the small carpenter bees. It's a different genus, it's called Ceratina. And they don't technically dig into wood. Uh, they only are strong enough to dig into pithy stems. So they go after things like broken stems of uh, raspberry, right? And they'll dig out the pith and they'll lay uh, their, they'll put a pollen ball in there and lay an egg on it uh, and then use the pith uh, to form a partition to protect it from the elements. So those are also technically called carpenter bees, uh, but they're called the small carpenter bees and, and they're only going after pithy stems. But big carpenter bees are nice, I like them. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> Eloise, before you go, um, I was just going to say, um, we'll probably wrap this up in the next five minutes. Um, I also want to say hi to Denise and Ann and Bob. Um, 
and um, yeah, this thing cuts off at 8.30. But if people want to jump off now, you can. If people are still into the Q&A, we have a few minutes for that. Eloise, go ahead. Um, I had two sort of unrelated questions. One is, what is your uh, what is your opinion about the these sprays that people are getting for their yards, uh, supposedly for mosquitoes? I, I, for one, can't believe it. Only kills mosquitoes without killing every everything else. And my other uh, question is about. Um, uh, we were talking in our community about creating a bee highway where where bees would go from yard to yard to yard. But it sounds like what you've said is the best thing for bees is to plant big clumps of um, bee loving uh, uh, flowers, plants, whatever, uh, rather than um, you know creating some kind of um, of a highway for for the bees. Well, highways are good. I mean, that's what I was talking about when I was talking about broken habitat, which is how do the bees get from one area to the other when there's large areas of nothing in between. Um, so what you're talking about is making continuous habitat, which is great. Uh, I would do that. Um, the other part was the mosquito spraying. That clearly kills bees. Now, if you read the, the laws, uh, they have to spray those at night. They don't. They spray them anytime they want to. The in, in on insecticides, it usually the the term that's used is the label is the law, and it literally means what's written on that label is the law. That's when it says it has to be applied this way. The law requires you to apply that way, and most of the time, those those companies that are trying to make money, you know. You, you ask them to come in and kill the mosquitoes in your yard, they're just gonna come in and, and fog your yard in the middle of the afternoon, which is gonna kill bees and everything else. And most mosquitoes are out either at dawn or at dusk and very few at the middle of the day. Um, but yeah, so there's nothing worse than uh, all of these insecticide companies that travel through neighborhoods coming and spraying those companies make money when they put out pesticide, not in insecticides and all that other stuff, even when there's not a problem, all right? Farmers, on the other hand, an insecticide is a cost to a farmer. A farmer is going to test, do I need to, can I tolerate this? If not, then they're going to apply, and they're only going to apply the minimum they can get away with because it's a cost to them. So farming usually uses a lot less insecticide per acre than homeowners do. Um, so yes, insecticides are bad. Insect fogging for mosquitoes is bad. Thanks, Can Charlotte. I, hey, go ahead, Charlotte. Uh, how far do bees travel from their hive to find All right. food? All right, so honeybees uh, usually go no more than uh, three miles to collect nectar. Uh, once you go beyond three miles, the nectar that they can bring back, uh, th they have to spend more energy flying there to get it than to get back. But the bottom line is bees will only go as far as they need to go. All right. Ta -da! That's a simple one. If all if everything they need is right here within you know 10 feet of where they uh, are nesting, that's all the farther they're going to go. Uh, but bees are really, really good about dispersing too. So when that nectar source, when that pollen source, dries up and is gone, they move on. And, and they're really good about moving on. Um, but lots of bees have been found where you know, they catch a bee, they mark the bee, they take it a mile away, let it go, and then they catch that bee again, and they take it two miles away and let it go. And, and so they found bees, traditionally the larger bees, can make it back to their known high from nine or 10 miles away at times. Uh, littler bees obviously are not gonna fly that far. Um, but again, when they're when they need to and there's no pollen and nectar in this area, they, they they'll fly forever till they find what they want. And how do they find what they want? Because it's amazing how uh, a pollen specialist bee will find the flowers they want. Um, is it by eyesight? Probably not. Um, it's probably by scent. Um, you know, bees have antennas, that's their nose and they can probably smell what they need to smell. It's amazing. 
but they find the plants they need. Tim, Tim, can you um, talk one more time about, so the melly B and the formic acid, is that a new threat or is that always there and it's just few and far between? Can you just dive okay. a little bit more? Okay, so there's a, there's a whole genus of those bees, all right? And it's the genus Oxytragona, but there's only 11 uh, uh, species in that genus that uh, have uh, formic acid for saliva. And they've been found in the tropics and they're exclusive to the American tropics. And there's very few of them. And they will only go after you uh, if they're defending their hive. If you find them at a flower and you flick them off the flower, they're not gonna come get you. That's the, the using of formic acid is a defensive thing when they're defending their hive, all right? So when we're cutting the log open that's got their colony in it, ripping it open and taking out the colony and putting it in a box, um, they get very defensive. So it, it's not a thing where they're attacking people and killing people in the tropics. That, no, those bees don't do that. Um, so, and, and, and they've been in the tropics forever and they're not killing people. Thanks. Nice.